foot. I think you've got your uh, board instruments here. <laughs> yes. I play, every, everybody comes in and says, can I buy this or that? And I go, no, that's some of my own personal instruments. And they go, why are they in the window? And I go, well, because I need to put them someplace. I've got so many instruments, I, I've got to put them somewhere. <laughs> People are always so shocked that, that, you know, I play them all. But I play them all. It only took me uh, 14 years to learn to play over 50 music instruments. So first, let's just hear you play something. I want to hear your tone and, and listen to your breathing and um, play a scale or an arpeggio or a song you know. God, that's a beautiful looking horn. That's old. 1924. And it's in tune? It's, it, it does A440? Did you have to have it extended or something? No, no. Oh, you're so lucky. I have a clarinet from that period of time and it's tuned about five pitches slower. Oh, is that right? Yeah, they, they used to, they didn't use 440 back in the day. They used to use like about 435. Uh-huh. This woman that just left, she has a Zydeco button accordion, and I found out it's tuned to 430. Wow. And that's why she couldn't figure out what tune it was in, because it's, it, and it turned out it was made in about the 1880s. Wow. So it was actually made before the turn of the century. So now, first of all, your read, are you putting it even or slightly over? Uh, just, uh, even. Just slightly, it's just about or slightly be, yeah. Slightly behind. Yeah. Some people do it slightly behind, some in front. takes a long time to play in tune. Yeah, I'm having trouble with that uh, middle D. Yeah. Um, I, I can tell you right off the bat, part of it is the uh, ligature that you're using. You're using these metal ligatures. And that's a big, big, big problem. The first thing we did with Tony was we threw it away. And we bought one of the strap ones. Have you seen those? Yeah. Now the strapped one is a flexible. It's more flexible. Pull it off of here. Let's see, it's like this. Right, I have one of those. So that's what I want you to start using. Now, there's a reason for this. What happens is when this reed is on here, the best way to get tone is for the whole reed to be able to move. Right. And the problem with that metal thing is that it girdles it in, gussets it so tight, especially right here, that only the top two thirds of the reed can move. Right. This bottom part can't actually move. So using this type of a cloth. Now what Tony did is he bought one of these and he hated it. He didn't like it either. Yeah, I didn't like it. Yeah, so what he did is he took a cloth, just a piece of uh, cloth, and he wraps a cloth around there twice and ties a knot in it. Well, you know what I've been using? I've been using a wooden ligature. Wooden ligature? Oh, yes, an old wooden. Oh, my God, I haven't seen one of those since I was a kid. I got this guy from uh, Salton, Texas, makes them. And uh, so I, I like that on my other. I would use that. I would go to that or something like that. Is that, that, that what? 
Now, this is the, that's another reason why it's squealing on you, because the, the ligature is holding the reed so tight, the reed is yeah. folding well, when I you get certain notes. I, I can tell you why I, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's squeaking. Mm -hmm. It's because, you see, when you press the octave key, um, um, okay, when I, I've got my D down, yeah. and I press the octave key, okay, I had the D down, I had the, uh, the, the the fingers for D down first. It does you see the way the octave key doesn't move. Yeah, it's not moving. But when I go out, see that little blitz right there? Yeah. That's what that's what's causing the squeak. Because if I put a rubber band here Ah, oh, I hold it in yeah, and so it's leaking. Yeah. That's so so leaking. so it doesn't squeak when I so put a rubber band there. You should have someone check the machines and see if they can calibrate that for you. Yeah. If not, another thing to do is to have an oversized piece of cork put in there. They have the same physical dimensions, but they have different thicknesses. And if you put a slightly thicker one, that would hold the hole closed more. See what I'm getting at? Yeah. Like a pillow. Right. Like a pillow. I'd probably put it on the back here, but, that, uh, but you see, it's, 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 it's a, uh, it's a uh, mechanical thing. Because, right. Because when you press it's, the, it's see, this, yeah. see, the movement of the octave key is, is faster than the movement, see, the, the movement of the D, to get the D's down. Yeah. That takes longer than it does for the octave. Oh, yeah, to bounce. And I see it bounces, yeah, it's bouncing on you. And what happens is it just leaks a little and that creates a squeal. But what happens is with a little bit of time playing, what happens is I think you get a little moisture there, a little spit, and, so it, and it, it fills it in. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. So if you get a cork that's a little bit thicker, it would act like. You could always just, could always just spit on it. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm tuning my horn. <laughs> so, what do you think? So, what what kind of things did you do um, um, with uh, with Tony? Well, uh, a lot of uh, in the beginning, I used a lot of tone production, and I'll show you some secrets for tone okay. production. That's how he got that beautiful round tone. Um, there's a lot of things in terms of breath that you have to work on. And I don't know what your other teachers helping you work on? Are they working on mostly just breathing and getting you to move up and down the scale and the fingering patterns, or are they working on breathing techniques? Well, they're trying to get me to breathe, uh, breathe right. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, one teacher is really, well, one of the, I mean, the stuff that I've been doing is, is really uh, very basic, for example. Right. Um, you know, like um, being able to um, play the scale perfectly. Right. And uh, and um, and not uh, tonguing in between the notes, and being able to go play evenly. I mean that that legato tonguing. Yeah. So you're going la 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 la. Too, that you're doing with your hand that are slowing you down. Um, for one, when you're picking, you're picking your fingers up way too high. Well, I know. That's and, another and thing I've been working on. No. Trying to keep the face. Uh, that's, that's Do you know what one. double face tape is? Yeah. Double face tape. You buy that you, for hanging up pictures. Buy yourself a little bit of double face tape and cut out little tiny squares that are about the size of your horn. Okay. And what I want you to do is put double face tape on each of these buttons. Now when you grab it, what happens is your fingers are going to stick to the tape. And as you go to pick up, if you pick your finger up too high, you'll feel the tape rip off, right? And the idea is to keep your fingers stuck on the tape. So what you're going to do is minimize your motion to only hold, holding the hole as high as the hole will go. And your finger will never lose contact with the, with the, with the horn, ever. And so using double face tape as a warm-up exercise is playing scales up and down and learn to do that, you'll have the minimum amount of motion. Another thing is, you see how you're hooking your fingers like this? Yeah. This is going to create a lot of arthritis issues in here. Another thing we try to do when we're playing is, when, you're, when you start playing, we always play with hooked fingers. Let me show you. I demonstrate it on my bamboo. Easier than I can. When, when you play, we always start with this hooked fingers thing. And what you're doing is you're trying to get this part of the pad, you see it like that, you can see you're getting that part of the pad right in there. 
to close those holes. But what happens is when your fingers are hooked like this, if you try to move them, it's very difficult for your hand to move because there's so much tension, right? So what happens is after you learn to play, you can only do this after you learn to play, you very slowly try to straighten out your fingers. Until instead of using the pad here, I use this part in here where it can leak. And I use that to close the holes like that. Until finally, I got to the point where I could just relax my hands and keep them straight. And then when your hands are straight, instead of playing with the tips, you're playing, yeah, like that. And now if you watch Ross on Roland Kirk, he plays all the way up on his knuckles like this. And the reason is you can flutter your fingers faster like this than you can when they're curved. Yeah, and, don't, and you don't have to move as far. And also what you do is you just barely lift it and it's leaking, you put it back down, you only need that much motion instead of instead of this. Right? So you get this much motion. And I call this fluttering. Fluttering. So when your hands are curved, you try that, you'll see you can't move them fast. You straighten them, relax, now try and see they'll flutter. So if you don't try to hit with the tips, use the right. And you see right where the joint is? Right there is the spot. Yeah, see? Now you can keep, and this is something you're going to have to work on very slowly to get used to playing your scale. Keep the fingers straight. That's it. And don't, don't hit the tips. Like I said, keep, keep them in. There you go, like that. Fingers flat. Now try it. And do it very slow. because of these side buttons here. You're going to have problems with the side buttons and it's going to force your, your hand to curve. It's harder with the left hand though to get, to get it flat and that takes, again, it takes a little while. But ideally you want to move toward doing it where your fingers are just relaxed and straight. They're naturally Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the first thing is we learned to play, and then as time went on, I made them flatten out. 
more and more. And now he can actually balance, he can actually balance the thing with one hand and uh, like this. I can actually look to it with his with the tip and he can hold the whole thing with one with just these two fingers now. And these fingers are completely free to do whatever you want. <laughs> See? So how does he go up they uh, go up to these high Again, you have there's a thing you have to learn to rotate the thumb to get that octave instead of or do this kind of a, a motion. So I I myself I put my thumb sort of at an angle like this so I'm ready to hit that thing flat. So I actually put my finger I split my thumb and then pull my thumb back and. Like switching you can feel your lip just slightly changing to get those two positions right what you'll find is there's a fish in between which will actually play both notes at once Let's see if I can do it on my food here for you so here's the low note high note well now listen now I'm going to play both where you have to kind of breathe down on it 
and you breathe forward to the lock, if you breathe down on it, and then you hit this one spot in between and you'll hear both of them. And that, learning to hold that as you go up on each, you're going to have to find it on every single note because it's in a slightly different place on each note. It's not, there is no one sweet spot, unfortunately. And it depends on the horn, too. You'll find some horns, you, you'll be able to play that easily, and you grab another horn, you can't find it. So it takes time to learn to kind of feel that, to work with your horn, and the horn has to learn to work with you. And it's all about finding that, I call this these split edge points, these split edge spots. Okay? Now, I, see, what, what I, my, now this is just my um, naivete. Um, what I'm, what I'm thinking I've been hearing is uh, I'm playing the low, uh, you know, the low note, and then I'm playing one octave above. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't aware that I was splitting it. Yeah. You want to split it? You want but, 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 to find but, that slot? Okay. okay. And what that's going to do is force your lip to be in exactly one point, which is ready to hit either octave, depending on what you do with your mind. If you're right on that edge. I think the high note, it comes out, I think the low note, it comes out, I play both of them at once, I think the high note, it comes out, I think the low note, it goes, and what happens is instead of your, your lips doing this to adjust, they very lightly adjust, because it's literally a razor's edge <laughs> that this thing is at, and when you find that split point on that razor's edge, you want to work there, that's where the best tone's going to be, yeah, and right. eventually you'll be able to back off with the air and play softer and softer until you can play so soft that someone will actually have to put their ear on the horn to hear you. you I, I, get to the, I, can't, I haven't played for a while, but you get, the, you get to the point where when you're playing, or I can go like that. Real soft, I can right. play. And I can still get tone on each of those notes. So I've been working on that too. I, and you know, in other words, uh, I, I've watched these videos and they were saying, well, you know, when you blow the notes, tr try to do it two ways. One was just using the air. Yes. And then, the, and then the second way is um, with tongue in. Um, but they said that generally they like the air method. Right. Right. And the reason for the air method is. In order to start and stop the read, you have to give it a little kick. Okay? So when you're playing the air method, what you're really doing is accenting the air by giving a little push to go and then back off, right? You then back off. Instead of going and you like that or ta, you're going and back off. So instead of saying ta ta ta, I'm saying gug gug gug, using a G sound. Gug 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 gug. that are soft consonants, not hard consonants. So like gug, goog, gig, giga, googa, ga, ga, goo, gig, ga, ga, goo. I like to say ga, goo, ga, goo, ga, goo, ga, goo like a kid. And I go ga, goo, 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 ga, goo. And that'll give you a legato tonguing. It kicks the reed and then backs off just enough to get the reed started. Tonguing. There's two ways, two basic things about tonguing. When you're tonguing, you either touch the back of your teeth with your tongue and then say ta, or you touch the reed with your tongue and say ta. Which one are you doing? Are you actually touching the reed with your tongue when, you, when you're tonguing? 
ta 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 ta. Are you telling it with your with your tongue your tongue hitting the reed? Or you're below the reed. I'm hearing you're below the reed. Your th tongue is under the reed and you're pulling it back. Try using the tip of your tongue right on the tip of the of the reed. And you can actually with your tongue you can the reed will, will And the other thing is, um, what, what should I be doing? What should I be doing? Whichever you want. The thing is, is what I do is I'm going to show you three or four ways to do something, and then you pick which one feels good for you. Okay. So there is no one way to do something. Okay. Sure. Um, uh, before we get to this, now what were we doing with the? Um, what were we doing with the? Uh, we were talking about the um, um, the airstream. Yes. And uh, we were talking about. Was it ga? Ga or goo. Goo goo goo. Goo goo goo. G U goo. Goo goo or G U goo. I I usually say goo ga goo ga goo ga goo ga or goo 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 ga goo ga goo ga goo ga if you want a double tongue. Goo ga ga goo ga ga goo ga ga is triple tonguing. Legato triple tonguing. Just like you say ta ta ka ta ka ta ka ta ka ka is triple tonguing. Ta ka 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 ka. No, but before we did that, we, when we were blowing the air. Ga. Ga, ga, ga. Ga, ga, or goo, goo. The idea is ga, that it creates a in the bottom of the throat, and so the starts the read for you. It gives it a kick without having to use your Ga, goo, goo. Yeah, ga, goo, goo. Ga, 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 or ga, goo, 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 goo. Ga, goo, ga, goo, ga, goo, ga. I usually go ga, goo, ga, goo, ga, goo, ga, goo, when you're doing opposite notes. Ga gu 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 ga and that's all the throat. Now with the tonguing, you were suggesting several methods. Yeah, there's. There's several methods to every one of these, and the thing is, is you try them all, and you find out they'll all change the sound. Some will be mechanically harder than others, and some will give you a unique tone that you want, that you want to become associated with. Right. That was the thing. Uh, the first year I worked with Tony, we just learned to play. We just played, and we he learned to read in all kinds of keys. Then what we did is, in the second year, we settled down, and we started working on these things, the tone building, the breathing, uh, the phrasing, again, phrasing and breathing are very, very thing. Uh, uh, using consonants and, and, and vowels for tonguing. Uh, eventually, what you want to do to get that beautiful phrasing is actually say the words when you're playing. You mean, uh, you mean uh, the words of the tune? You mean? Yes. Yeah. So instead of saying, instead of going, um, let's see. I'm doing summertime. There, I'm just playing it and tonguing it. I'm just saying ta 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 da ta 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 ta. So you, you listen again. There, I'm using a ta 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 tonguing. Now watch what happens when I actually say the words. Saying summertime and the living is easy. Well, you know that's what I, I heard something I just did. Um, I, I saw you had done this Amazing Grace uh, song. Yes. I, I have it from your book. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, actually, uh, this other guy I was listening to on the Net Music. He 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 was he, doing Amazing he's Grace. He's doing the duplets instead of the triplets, though. Yeah. And then uh, so then I. Um, 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 I uh, transposed this, and then I wrote in. I, I did your number. Yes. And then I also wrote in the word amazing grace. How, how sweet, sweet the, the sound. sound. And so this is right. my phrasing. I did. This. That's right. Amazing grace.
the breath is the end of a phrase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah I've been working on that, and and um, so one of my teachers really got on me um, for uh, how I was breathing. I was yes, I, yes. and not holding on to the uh, the mouthpiece, and so I, I I've been I can do that now. <laughs> Because you got so much to have to support after right. that. So, uh,
breath. Some people, what they do is they either want to put the reed, the tip, the, the tip of this thing, they like the reed to go just a little bit beyond the tip, okay, like that, so there's a little bit, and I, I, I prefer that, because it gives me more reed and it vibrates easier, okay? Other people like it to be exactly right there, that reed to be perfectly even, and then some people like it to be actually lower, like this, like that. Thing. So there's a little gap there. So this is what is recommended to start with. And then what you want to do is try pulling your reed down or pushing it forward until it feels good for you. Okay. Now, what makes a difference with this is actually where you're putting your teeth. Are you biting the top of your mouthpiece or are you just using your gum? I'm biting. Yeah, good. See, what you have to do is you have to actually put your teeth on this guy. Right. Right. And then you're rolling your lips under like that. So you're gumming this part here, so this is free to move, and you're biting here. Now, another thing that will change the tone is where you bite. Let's say you're playing rock and roll. You do not want to have that beautiful academic tone when you're playing rock and roll. You want it to sound dirty, and you want it to sound more like a trumpet. So I'm going to take it now. What you're going to do is, yeah, put your teeth here, and the, the, higher, the higher you bite, the higher you bite, the raspier the sound. 
So the higher you bite, the raspier the sound. And then what's going to happen is if you bite too high, it'll get out of control. It'll go, woo, and you won't be able to, right? So what I do is I wait for right inside, and then I just back off a little. And then put my teeth, plant my teeth there, and rah. And what you'll get is a real rah, 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 dirty jet rack sound. Now, if you want to get more of a fundamental and be smoother, you're pulling your teeth back to where you normally like to keep it. What happens is if you pull your teeth up here, what you're going to do is you're going to put some pressure here and squeeze the reed between your teeth and your lip, and it's going to stop the reed from moving, and what you're going to get is a very fundamental sound. All the rich overtones will just disappear. Right. And if the same thing happens on a guitar, by the way. If I strike the guitar here below the blowhole, listen to the, the tone. Now watch what happens when I do it above the blowhole. Can you hear how dead it sounds? Compared to this? Much richer? Now the further back I go, listen. Sounds like tin. I come forward. Now it's, the, the highs are disappearing. The highs are disappearing. And now if I hit it right at the 12th fret, that's the fundamental. And now you don't hear any overtones at all. Now that's what happens when you're high on the reed like this, or you're low on the reed. Right, you get that. You start moving back, you start hitting the tone. You'll find that the, the guitar is tuned, so right over the center of the hole is where you get the most sound. Then as we start backing up, then you start getting that raspier, dirty sound. So the higher you blow, the raspier it is, the closer to the tip you get, the more fundamental that it is. And again, what you want to do is find a place. Now, Tony liked to be a little high because he liked to get rid of that raspy sound. And he likes a really round, beautiful, clean tone. So what he did is he pushed forward a little bit. And, 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 and uh, we found this place where he was playing and getting a good thing. And then what he did is he pulled back a little bit on the reed. And right at that spot, he got a really nice round tone. Okay. Now, so that's reed placement and how you're tying the reed up will determine. Another thing is when you do put the ligature on, one thing you could do with these metal ligatures is open it up wider. So instead of putting it on here, which is where you have it right now, if you open it wider and put it down here so your, your reed comes down your reed comes down like this, right? So you put it on so it's at the back, back of the reed, so as much reed as you have. And so this thing, actually, if you opened it up, it'll go down about another quarter of an inch or so, and uh, you'll be able to get it underneath where the see the reeds cut like that yeah. you want it below that spot. well you know that's funny because on my other one um i on the wood ligature i'm way down i found I, I i i they gave me three of the ligatures and i sanded one out ah so it comes down it comes down about the two-thirds mark exactly and that's much better it's more it's control it's aren't you it's a, it's a nice time yeah nice, yeah and that's what you want that's exactly what i'm saying and and, and again if we can replace this piece of metal with something soft like those canvas ones. Now, Tony, when he even had the canvas one, that was too constrictive and wasn't kind enough. So what he did is he got a silk scarf, and he wraps a silk scarf around it twice and then ties a knot in it. And if you ever go see Tony live, it looks like he's got a little bunny rabbit tied on it. It's just adorable. You know how people like to wear scarves and ascot? Looks like he has an ascot on his back. It's just adorable. And what he does now is he has different colors, and he color coordinates it with his socks. So he has a red one, he's wearing red, red socks, he wears a blue one, he's got blue socks, and that, when he gets on stage, people go, just like instantly makes a statement, right? But he found that he can tighten that as tight or as loose as he wants, and by putting a double knot, he can anchor that, that down. So he's not using a ligature at all, he's using a piece of cloth, literally, and tying, tying the reed down. The other thing about that is you can tie the reed, if you um, take the cloth and you fold it and then fold it, and fold it, you can get it a big, wide, flat area, and the cloth can cover more area like this, covers like this much area. Uh, and all of this is flat, nice and flat, so this whole reed can move like that. It's quite nice. And that's where he's, where, that's where he's getting the tone. Okay, twisting. Another thing, you don't have the problem with this sax, but with other saxes where you have a little the, the bell horn that comes out, if you twist that, you can change the tone. Now, I don't know if you've ever watched uh, some old films of Billie Holiday singing, but she had a sax player, Mr. Young. And Young was very famous. And what he did is he had a tenor sax, and he twisted the head on the tenor sax 
So his tenor sax, it came like this, and came out like this, and he held the tenor sax up, God knows how he did it, held it up and played it like it was a flute. And if you ever see, the first time I saw a film of him holding the tenor sax out like this, and playing, I thought, what the fuck is he doing? I thought the guy's brain dead or something. But then I tried it on my sax, and what happens is when you twist that thing to the side and pull these really like that, instead of the air going through straight and going down, it rotates, and the air creates a little tornado. And that little tornado rotates around the corner, and it helps to get rid of all the, the bends and twists in the, in the thing. And what happens is, as the tornado comes down through the horn, it comes up out of the horn, and for, I just tried it as an experiment, I took a cigarette and played, and you could see the smoke twirling out of the horn. It's amazing. When you play it normally, the air just comes out like in a billow. But you twist that thing, and all of a sudden you can see the air comes out twisting. And that twisting creates the most beautiful tone. And that's how he got that gorgeous tone that Mr. Young had. It's amazing. But the man's holding up the, I don't know if tenor sax is there. Heavy. He's holding the tenor sax in midair, and you can't rely on the, on the strap, because the strap ain't holding it up. Well, you know what, I, 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 the thing I like about the sax so much is it's relatively light. Um, oh yeah, that is light. It only weighs about two pounds. My, uh, my Yamaha weighs about four pounds. So this is brass covered with silver. This is real silver. Is it? Do you think it is? Yeah, that's real silver coating, because I know my French horn is uh, silver. Absolutely. So what they did is they took a brass horn like this and they silvered it. And they put this beautiful silver, this uh, matted silver finish. You see here, this is where the like chrome mm -hmm. is, there, and then the rest is got this. So, so it's not it's not just a chrome. Uh, no, it's actually it tarnishes black, right? It goes yeah. real black. Yeah, that's why. By the way, if you use like a toothpaste or any kind of silver polish, it'd be very good to oh. get rid of the black around them. Sometimes if the black builds up too much, you want to you know, clean it out sure. and do that. Um, if you use toothpaste, uh, use it with your finger. Don't use it with a cloth because it's too abrasive and it will scratch. So I just put a little bit of toothpaste on my finger and just rub it around and then just polish it off. And just, I, I do that. My French horn is solid silver. And um, when I had it made when I was a kid, I, had it, I was four years old when I played French horn. When I was 12, I was able to buy a French horn. And the King Corporation had just started making French horns. They were famous for their trumpets and trombones, but they didn't make French horns. This was the first French horn at King Corporation. I actually went to Elkhart, Indiana, where they built the damn thing, and went to the factory to have it designed for me. Wow, that's where this was made. Yeah, Elkhart, Indiana, was where everything was made. All the good instruments are made there, still American made. Um, so I went there, and actually they put a silver finish on it for me. Now what happened is, um, number of years back, I, I had a fire at my house. And what the fire did is it tarnished the entire horn solid black. And then when I went to polish the horn, it turned gold. So it's silver, black, and gold now my French horn. It's got the most amazing patina and tarnish on it. It's just it's gorgeous. And when I play it, people just look at it and go, what the hell? <laughs> they can't understand what kind of metal. But the thing about the silver is, is it bends more, it's softer metal, and so it lets the brass bend a little bit more. Now, often they put uh, like a, a copper coating and then they'll put a lacquer finish over and that tightens the, tightens the horn up and it doesn't play as well. It's better to have this kind of soft matted patina finish and the horn can vibrate more. Well, you it know, plays better. Well, you know, I, I had this uh, rebuilt and, um, and then uh, and it came, I, I bought it in San Francisco like 30 years ago. Mm. And the guy says, oh, you know, this thing cannot, it doesn't sound good. You'll never be able to play professionally with it. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and, you know, and it came with this mouthpiece. It was a Selmer. It oh, a Selmer, yeah. It had a Selmer, and it said Selmer Parrot, right? right? right. And, you know. Toss it. <laughs> well, no, but I found out, because I was, uh, I was looking at all these different mouthpieces. I read this thing, and I said, look, you know, the reason. And, and so... I realized why it wasn't sounding good because it had a narrow opening in mm -hmm. the And I read the narrow thing, bore. Moral bore. Yeah. And so um, I went and got these, uh, tried out these different wide, uh, wide open bore. Right. Thing, and it was like I had a new one. Yeah. And um, the other thing I found out, that mouthpiece that this came with, mm -hmm. 
was a cell Marsolis to go for like four fifty, five fifty. Yeah, they're, they're expensive, but they, they, they fit with the summer. Yeah. The problem with the, when you're using other brands of mouthpiece, you really have to experiment with them to find one that sounds good on your own. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they can make a major difference. Oh, I know. I, 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 I you know, I said, I said, hey, you know, I, I almost didn't need another horn because it was a mouthpiece. When you get a mouthpiece you like, tr cherish it. Yeah. I tell people, it's the one thing in your life you should take care of. Well, I think, we're, okay, I so, think we're on the right track here. So let's, it, okay, so we got that. The other thing is, some people do not put the thing on straight. Sometimes they'll twist it slightly and turn it slightly so they can move their hand slightly one way or another. When you twist it off center, it will change the tone as well. So actually putting the mouthpiece on and twisting it at a slight angle will make a difference in the tone. And again, you want to do what's... Uh, they always start with it being perfectly centered because that's the what we call the academic or the college sound. Right. And then what you do is you play with it and play with the reed until you get the sound you like. Right. And so that's all about that. The next thing that we were talking about was octaves. And this is, I want you to really work on this. And you can work on this tonight. You play an octave and then you, you play an octave, you play the low note. And the high note. Then the low note. And then get a rhythm going and I go. And when you can do it like that, you can bounce easily. And you, you feel you feeling that little change in your lip. Now what you want to do is make that motion. And the only way I can describe this like this. Say I'm taking my hand and I'm going like this. Right? Now there's a center in there, and the way I can find the center is by slowing my hand down and making less and less motion. I will finally find a spot in which I find the exact center for the rest. That point is neutral, and that's what we're looking for when you're bouncing on these octaves. You're hitting, when you hit the low octave, when you hit the low octave, you tend to be blowing across the reed. When you're hitting the octave, you're blowing down on the reed. So what's happened is, um, here's the mouthpiece, here's the reed. If I'm blowing my air this way into the reed, I'm going to get the lower octave. If I come down like that, you get the higher octave. And what you want to do is switch between these up and down so you can get it really comfortably. So it's clean. And then what I want to do is you see these two points? I'm going to bring them closer and closer together like this. So they get closer and closer together until there's just one tiny little area that when I barely move, you can't see any difference in my lip hardly anymore now. Then I'm going to try to find both. rocking back and forth and trying to make this this edge shorter and shorter, you're going to find that exact center point where it splits and you see both out here, both octaves, it's going to be different for every hole. And what you want to do is just play like two holes, one up and down on one octave and then up and down on the next hole and then up and down and up and down and then try to find the split point, hit the split point and then move to the next hole and see if you can hit the split point. 
So the idea is, is that you can move from one hole to the next, to the next, to the next, and still split, still split the sound and hear both octaves. That is going to, now you, at, when you do this at first too, you're going to need uh, quite a bit of air to do this. It's going to take a bit of air to hear both both the, the lower and the upper octave at the same time and hit that split point. What you do next is work on backing off and using less and less air. So at the least, the less air you use and still hit the split point, the more efficient you're breathing. And what's going to happen is eventually you're going to use only enough air to get the sound going. And that's what I want you to work on tonight. That's the, that's, the, that's the most important thing you can work on. It's just take three notes and play their octaves and then just work around on those holes until you can play the octave, bounce up and down carefully, okay. and hit the split point on each note. Okay? If you can do that by tomorrow, that'll be a really happy puppy. Yeah, I, I, and, you will, and you will hear an immediate LA. improvement in your tone. Immediately. It'll just boom. And what you're finding is what we call the golden point. There's a spot when you're breathing kind of at exactly it? the so center uh, of the note. Uh, that uh, split point is where the center of the note is. You won't find it anywhere else. Okay, so that's what I want you to work on tonight. And you'll, you'll see, you'll be able to do that later. Uh, spend about a half an hour just trying that. And you'll see it takes about a half an hour. It takes about 10 minutes to find it. And then about another 20 minutes to keep it, <laughs> right? And just work on that. That's going to be the biggest. The split octave is going to make the biggest improvement in your, in your tone that I know of. And it's going to help. It's going to start helping you to control your breath. Tomorrow we're going to work on yeah. loud and soft. It's hard to deal with those time differences. <laughs> now, Angel, yeah. he's going to need. You're going to want to do this. All the way up until Friday, every day, till Friday, or every other day, or what? What to do? Well, I, I'm going to uh, 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 do it every day. If, if that's possible, I'm, I'll be here till uh, next Tuesday. I don't know what your schedule is. And wh so, what is your opinion about the weekend? Well, you mean like Saturday and Sunday? Mm -hmm. I can do a Saturday or Sunday as well. well closed, as you know, I'm usually closed, but well, well, I'm no. more than willing to do that. Oh, no, I don't want to take you out. If, 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 if you okay, close, so, so we'll just do from now until Friday. Give me a break, and then and Monday, then Monday I guess, and, and then Tuesday you'll take off. Depending, depending yeah. on when you leave Tuesday? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I, I really appreciate it. And you. the other... Uh, the other uh, let's see. Yeah. So my... Um, 4.30 oh. to 5.30 tomorrow, canceled. Okay. That's available. 4.30 to 5.30, then why don't we do that? Then? That's good. That's okay. good. That's good. That's good. Okay. Now, tomorrow, that's good, because then I won't run into, see, if we did it at 6, I had the problem on Wednesday night, I have to go set up a camera. Okay. Sure. So what happens is, uh, uh, I don't want to okay. have to run off and do the camera, so we can do that. That'd be earlier. That's good. Now well, Thursday evening. Four thirty. Is Alaris not coming? It would be four thirty on Thursday. Yeah, four thirty to five thirty. Yeah. Yes, that would be Same good because that'll Thursday. give me time to get ready for the. The other thing I wanted to know is what are you doing Thursday evening after seven? You and your wife. Um, got anything planned right now? Um. Not really. Except for dinner. Well, here's what I here's what I'd like to propose. On Thursday evening from seven o'clock until ten o'clock, I do an open mic one block from here. Down the block here uh, at 2059 Hayes is a place called the Sacred Grounds Cafe. And also he owns a place called Panhandle Pizza right next door. Yeah, I just buy there. Yes, the pizzeria and the, and the Sacred Grounds, okay? Thursday evening from 7 o'clock until 10 o'clock, I have an open mic, and you and your wife should come on by. I'll, I'll, I'll get you, I'll, I'll buy you guys a beer and um, introduce you to some of my friends and people, and you get to see people come from the neighborhood here, mostly singer-songwriters. It's acoustic only, so only people who can come and play acoustic instruments come, and they do singer-songwriting. I, I host it, and you get a chance to see what happens at the Sacred Grounds. Okay. And uh, it's a nice place if you ever want to learn to play something and you're in town, go there and play something for us. You, we let each person play two songs, and then they take turns. And 
and, uh, and playing with each other. It's kind of fun. Um, so it'll give you some entertainment, and he has great food there, by the way. The pizzeria is, um, when he took over the pizzeria, he couldn't get a good pizza. So I called my aunt in Chicago, my aunt Elsie, who's a fifth generation Chicago Italian. And she actually gave me her family secret recipe, which I've been trying to talk her out of for 52 years. And she wouldn't give it to me, but she gave it to me, and I gave it to him, and God damn it, he now makes the best damn pizza in town. Well, I'm a real pizza freak, because oh, I grew yeah. up in New York. Ah, exactly. Uh, and I, I went to school in New York City, and I had uh, I was a block and a half from pizza place. I had pizza Oh, pizza yeah, yeah. You love pizza. Pizza, pizza. 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 Yeah. 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 pizza. But I got one. Panhandle, Panhandle pizza, pizza, now. pizza. It's new ownership. Over there, new ownership. A little Chinese fellow Didn't named like Teddy. Didn't like it before. Oh my God, he makes such a good pizza now. It's a real good Chicago pizza. Just um, delicious. Last question though. On Friday, I either have seven o'clock or three o'clock. That's it. Everything else is booked. On Friday. Or three o'clock. I don't think I could do three. It has to be seven. Can you do seven on Friday? Three o'clock? From three to what? To four? From mm -hmm. three to four? Because we got a four I got a four o'clock. Actually I can I can do that. I can do I can do that this Friday. I can do that this Friday. Okay, so would you like to do that uh, sure. from three to four on Friday. And then Thursday, uh four thirty. Four thirty to five thirty. Wednesday at four thirty. Then go get your wife and I'll meet you at the grounds. <laughs> Seven o'clock. See, we have David Cook and his son are going to be playing a feature there. And then we could probably also do next Monday, 4.30. Yeah. I don't think Maisie's coming back yet. No, Maisie's not coming back yet. So we have her time slot open as well. Well, that's great. You came at exactly the right time. Walter, yeah, you could have picked, people could have picked a time. better time, Walter. <laughs> really, during the summer, I'm, I, all the kids take the after school, you know, time slot. So usually from 3 o'clock until 7 o'clock, we're booked. But it's summertime. And then our, I don't know about the following Tuesday, 